Hi everybody, I'm here with owner Phil Howarth and we're here to talk about trying to catch tuna on the spin. Now, Phil, you go out try to catch these crazy fish on a spin rod. What is the best season to do that? I think the best, the best season for, for the tuna is when they're on top, mm -hmm. okay, which, which varies depending on what they're chasing. So you get them on sand eels, they're normally a little bit deeper, but they do push them up. Uh, a couple of years ago, the August bite was great. We're now, though, going into the real hardcore season when the half beaks and things are around. So kind of that September, October, November is a classic time to chase them on the spin. And there's often a lot of smaller fish around, which is what we're trying to target. Mm -hmm. Some good action there. Um, what's, what's your spin setup look like? Rod, reel, line? Yeah, so I think in the, in the rod department, I fish a company called Hanta. Um, I've fished them for a couple of years now, really mm -hmm. tough rod. Um, Van Stoel do a fantastic rod. Yeah, the 325G. Um, 325 is synonymous. It's almost indestructible. Mm -hmm. um, great entry-level rod. I prefer the stiffness of the Hansa because um, you can cast further. You can pretty put a hammer down on the fish. And from the real perspective, you've got things like the, the Shimano Saragossa is great on the smaller fish. Mm -hmm. As you step up to chasing bigger fish, you really want the um, Stella, in yeah. my opinion. Um, for smaller fish again on the Shimano side of it, the Twin Power um, yep. does it as well. And Daiwa now, the Daiwa Dogfight is a really great drag platform. And Van Stoel, to match the Van Stoel rod, the VS yep. series is great as well. So you've got some, some really good options there. So you got you got price point reels and all the way up to the, the Dogfight and the Shimano Stella, which yeah, you can fight giant after giant after giant with them. Yeah, those drags are insane. Yeah. All right, well, if you had to choose your top five lures, talking about strategic angler here, what are your go-tos and what are they imitating? You know, bunker, half beaks? Sure. So I think what you're looking at on the, on the lures is trying to match the hatch, which you really got to see what's in the water. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, if it's sand eels, you want something a sand eel pattern. The, the iconic lures for us, um, this is the half beak um, or the sori. Um, they start to come down south um, in August time. They're really starting to swim now. This is the Espada. I always use a sinking pattern mm -hmm. um, simply because the, there's a lot of shear waters. The birds are shear waters on the water and they will hit these and you end up with a shear water, which is just a pain. Never fun. Never fun. But where the sorry pattern is a fantastic one. It's always in the box. Mm -hmm. Always. Good. And then what I like to do at first light. Um, this is called the night flyer. It's that dark lure with a little bit of sparkle that picks up the first light. Mm -hmm. Creates a really cool silhouette. Um, really iconic way, you know, first light or really dark. It's a really overcast condition. Yeah. So this works really well. Low light situation. Yeah. Okay. And then the flip side of that is when you get it really light. Yeah. Because you fish something really light. It's a common misconception that you... You fish a light lure in the dark and a dark lure in the yeah, light. No. You actually, the, the fish are looking for the colors and the shadows. I think this is the day flyer, they call it, or the white flyer. Mm -hmm. Again, it's got that flash of sparkle in it, yeah. but great in that really bright conditions. Um, also can be a really good one if you, if you find you're in the squid. Mm -hmm. And it's really good, it's a very natural squid imitation as well. Yeah, a lot of times they're more white. Yeah, nice. and then more recently, last couple of years off the Cape, um, Merv made these for us last year. This is a bonito pattern. The bonito mm. really mm -hmm. started to run. Um, so what I asked him to do is to make us some bonito pattern. This is in the Nautilus. It's a bit of a fat allure. And this is also really good in the pogey pattern as well. But I like the bonito because, like I say, it's starting to match what the tuna are feeding yeah. on. Yeah. And to that theme, the last strategic I'll talk about, is sometimes we all get frustrated um, when they're on the butterfish. Yes, And you're course. fishing these really, really small ones, where it'd be, you know, this is the butterfish size, is actually in the in the um, half beak pattern. But the, this and this size in the butterfish. Yeah. You know, I've fished in two miles of breaking tuna and not being able to catch a fish because they won't take these bigger baits. Throw something like this in, you get the chance of uh, just getting them to turn because they're dialed into that smaller, um, slow swimming bait. So, yeah. Um, but this actually has the weight to cast as well. There you go. And is that in floating, sinking? Are they come in both? They come in floating and the sinking. I still like to fish the, the sinking, sinking because it's got a bit more weight to it. Yep. Um, the floating lures, you're, you know, if you are in a lot of half, uh, it's not a lot of half beaks, if you're in a lot of shear waters, the floating pattern is just going to get you into trouble, really. Yeah. So that's what yep. I use. Birds. Absolutely love them. And they're all, you know, they're, they're, they're epoxy lure. They're really solid. They're through wired um, and they're hand painted by Merv down in the Carolinas. So. Everyone is unique, which is kind of what I really like. He's a really good friend of the shop, 
very, very creative uh, lure painter. I really, really like his stuff. Good. And these are the ones, you know, these are, they, they're, the strategics are absolutely my go-to in my box. So obviously these are uh, pretty expensive when it comes to lures. Um, how durable are these? And do they get beat up with the trebles or single hooks, or do they, they withstand the, the abuse? I think it's fair to say these are a solid epoxy. Um, he uses 13 layers of epoxy over the top. So they're really tough, so you like them. Sorry about the noise. You know, not a mark. These things can take it. Um, what I do advise if you're running the boat a long way, so I use the Shimano Butterfly jig cocoons. Yeah, we have those. Just, yeah. to, just to wrap it. So eventually, yes, a sharp hook, can. scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing, it's going to get a rash. But yeah, Merv has some great video on his website. And he's actually pretty much driving a dumper truck over one of these. Really? And they hold up. So they're really tough lures. Well, good to know. That's excellent. Changing lure companies, we're going over to Nomad. Do you have a few favorite of their lures? Yeah, Nomad's a kind of new design. Damon, based in, uh, uh, in Australia, he's brought a couple out. Um, this is a Riptide. Riptide, really cool. Nice surface lure that I'm using this more as a walking the dog style. They're rigged with BKK hooks. So the Black King Kongs out of Hong Kong are, are arguably one of the best um, tuna grade mm -hmm. um, hooks with, with the inline singles, and I really love them. Hooks and split rings. Yep. There you go. And a Chug Norris, again, famed for GTs, a huge port at the front, really pushes a huge amount of water. So when they are spraying fish, really gives you opportunity to, to really push into it. And then often when I'm not casting, to be fair, when we're trolling around and we're, we're looking for fish, uh, especially when we're at the canyons, we run a deep diver. Um, this is a DX Minnow. Mm -hmm. You can dive down to about 30 feet. We've killed the big eye with this out at the canyons mm -hmm. this year. The yellowfin love it near the boat. But it's a great option whilst you're moving around to actually have a, something out the back of the boat. Yeah. Because you never know when they're going to come up and hit something. Yeah, absolutely. And at a cheaper price point, you know, just over 30 bucks. Yeah. And they are, they can definitely withstand the abuse as well. Um, what type of leader do you guys usually use? 80 pound, 100 pound fluoro? Depends on what's going on. If you if you if you aren't, we've talked so far. We've really talked about surface laws. You can actually mm -hmm. fish a heavier leader because they're attacking it. Yeah, you know, the laws ba barely hit the water. So you know, I fish normally 130. Yeah. I'm a big uh, fan of the of Basil's BHP wind yep. on leaders. I, on my reels, um, I fish Cortland C16 hollow core. Yep. What I love about that is we back splice a loop into it. Of course. It's a great line. It's slightly thicker um, than, than some of the other hollow cores, but I love, the, I love the way it's constructed. It's very soft. It's easy to splice into. But we tend to back splice a loop, and then I do a wind on. Mm. The mm -hmm. ability then is I want to go from 80 pounds to 130. It takes me two minutes. I'm yeah. quickly changing it out. So it allows me to change during the day, or if I get broken off with a fish, I can quickly do a tire wind on while yep. I have to re-splice, exactly. which I don't want to do on the boat. So Never. It allows me to do that really easily. Well, there you go. All right. And last question for those guys with the smaller center console boats trying to get into run and gunning, you know, chasing yep. fish topwater. Any tips on going fast, running and gunning? Going fast is always a good thing. <laughs> we know. Um, fast because I've run a fast boat. <laughs> I think where you're at really, the key thing when you're out there is, yes, you're looking for the splashes, mm -hmm. but more importantly, you're looking for the birds. Um, and you're looking for shear waters particularly. Yeah, Because shear the shear waters will be feeding with the whales, another great indicator. Um, but what you're looking for is the direction the birds are, are flying, and as they start to come from just flying aimlessly to actually circling, and you'll see them actually swarming almost, and they're following the tuna subsurface. They're waiting for those tuna to push the bait fish to the surface. They use the surface as obviously a ceiling that the yeah. bait fish can't get away from, and they push them up, and then the, the shear waters are coming down to press it. So the birds are a really key indicator. Yeah. And when you do see splashing fish, look at which way they're going. Yeah, true. They, they tend to push in a certain direction, mm -hmm. and if you can push 100 yards in front of them, the, the hopefully what you're going to do is get the shot as they come onto you. There you go. Um, and when you're casting, cast in front of the fish. These fish are swimming 20 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Don't cast at the fish, because by the time your lure lands, it's behind they're it. They're 20 yards in they front. They can't see it. Mm -hmm. So you cast in front of it. I find a game with the strategics is to cast it, let it drop for two or three seconds, and it's mm -hmm. long pull, long pull, long pull, and it starts the first two or three pulls on the lure, but, but you, you get normally that. get a takeoff. Yeah. Well, we've touched on casting. What about jigging for tuna? Okay. I think on the jigging side of things, there's times when the fish are deeper and you mark them, mm -hmm. but yep. they're not pushing the bait up. Yeah, classic. So you can sit there and wait for them to come up, or you can actually do something about it. There you go. 
And so there's a you know, various number of jigs on the market. And some of them you can actually cast. So if you look at this, is this is the Ron Z, synonymous with the Northeast. Uh, Ron Farr, who unfortunately is no longer with us, I invented this many years ago. It's a 10 inch mm -hmm. soft plastic, one of the most iconic tuna casting lures in the Northeast. Absolutely. Uh, Ronnie was a tuna casting machine, uh, bless him. Um, but this is in the silver metallic. You can cast these and work it. It's going to look like half beaks. Mm -hmm. But also what we've done really well is, is to just drop it off the side of the boat and dead stick it whilst we've been looking. Yeah. Um, in fact, last week I was on the slightly green version. I, I didn't catch the fish. We had a short strike and it cut it down here. Um, but a great way to bring them off the bottom. Yeah. And you're lifting it up and it will flutter back down. It's mm -hmm. a really, it look, really looks like an injured fish. So the Rons is, you know, if I had to have a, a, a soft plastic on my boat, this is the puppy I use. Definitely. I think the other things you've got now, you've got some great lures. Um, this is the Shimano, um, you know, the side jig there. You need to change the hook out on this one. This is designed for bass. But this is the pink and the silver yep. flash, obviously, when the squid are in the water. I re-rigged these with a um, assist hook from BKK. Yep. Just to give it that. A lure that's mm. been phenomenally successful this year is the Nomad Streaker. Um, the guys down in New Jersey, there's a wonderful bite off Hudson, and they were jigging these, and they're absolutely mm -hmm. killing smaller fish, you know, in the sort of like 45 to 65 inch category. And again, it's just a case of jigging it up, wind in jig, wind up jig. And then we've also got, you know, this is the, the, the Ahi um, Deception. Um, these now they're using, obviously, digital color printing yeah. over lead. Macro or so, so this is a macro pattern. It's kind of off macro pattern, but <laughs> Sardini looked at. But again, great as a, as a flutter bait. Yeah. Um, I actually had one of these just as a weight, cheating a bit the other week um, when I was fishing for mackerel for bait, and I actually had this ripped off by a tuna. Oh, um, Straight off the sabiki, which was an expensive one. <laughs> um, but again, again a, a great bait. So what you've got is these jigging baits are now giving you the option in conjunction with the casting baits that we already mm -hmm. talked about, the ability to, to fish on top and actually under the water at the same time. Well, there you go. And how many ounces do you generally fish when jigging? Jigging. The, the Ron's bought a new jig out, it's a five ounce head. Okay, so it's really five good. ounce head, yeah. Because what's happening is it's gonna scope out away from mm -hmm. you. Um, depends on the depth of the water and also you know, the, the depth of the fish and how fast the, the tide's going. If it's, yeah, of if course. it's absolutely ripping, you're just gonna scope away. Of course. Um, the lovely thing about the jigs is you can kind of really get a measure and get down to the down to the fish. You're looking to see them 60 fish. You can pretty much 60 feet, sorry. You can work out how to get your bait down to 60, so you can get your bait into the plane of water they're actually mm -hmm. actually in. But yeah, so that's jigging. Um, I th and I think you know every guy who goes out there is the good thing is 90% of the time um, you can use the same rod, the same reel. Yeah. I tend to fish a slightly lighter leader. Um, with my jigging rods, I actually have the Cortland C16 in black, mm. not in the white. Yeah. Because the the fish is actually going to have the ability to see your line better because it's obviously vertical, not on the surface. Just of course. Press at it. Of course. And um, so have a think about that. And they are more inclined to be leader shy. Okay. Um, so looking at 80, 100 pounds, that's rather 80, than yeah. 130. Yeah. There you have it. Casting, jigging, popping for tuna. We have it all here at Goose Hummock Shop. Thanks again, Phil. Cheers, mate. Appreciate Thanks. It.